welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. If you would like to become a patron of the podcast, we would love you to, and you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the history network. Thank you to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network dot all podcast season thirty four episode six tackling the Takao bravery beneath the waves of Singapore Harbour. This episode was written by Murray Darm. Murray is an ancient medieval military historian from New Zealand living in Australia. He has written more than 100 articles on various aspects of ancient and medieval military history, as well as other historical topics from all periods, ranging from the history of opera to the runic alphabet and recipients of the Victoria Cross. He is the author of Macedonian Phalangite versus Persian Warrior, Athenian Hoplite versus Spartan Hoplite, and Leuctra 371 BC, all from Osprey Publishing. He is a regular on the Ancient Warfare podcast, as well as a regular writer for us here. On July the 31st, 1945, the Japanese cruiser Takao sat at anchor in Singapore Dockyard. Little did her crew know that beneath the surface of the water... Royal Navy divers prepared to place magnetic mines which would take her out of the war. The Takao class heavy cruiser had been a threat to US and Allied forces throughout the Pacific War. She had been in action since 1941 and participated in many engagements, sinking enemy shipping and supporting various landings and evacuations. She had also survived several engagements where many other Japanese ships had been sunk. With the sinking of her three sister ships, Atago, Maya and Chokai, in late 1944, the cow, although damaged, remained a major threat in the theatre. As the Allied armies advanced towards Singapore, the Takao needed to be dealt with. The Royal Navy launched Operation Struggle on July 31st, 1945, to do just that. The operation would use midget submarines. HMS XE-3 was assigned to deal with the Takao and HMS XE-1, the Miyoko, another heavy cruiser in Singapore dockyard. The XE midget submarines had a crew of four CO, Deputy, ERA, Engine Room Artificer, and a seaman, at least one of whom was a qualified diver. British midget submarines had proven their worth against the Tirpitz in Norway in September 1943, and the XE series improved in the original design. The XE-3 carried two two two-ton Amatol side charges, and six limpet mines which would be attached to the hull of the target by the diver. The midget submarines were towed some of the way towards Singapore by S-class submarines and then set free to make their way independently through the Strait of Johor and into Singapore Dockyard. The journey took 13 hours and at various points the Japanese defenders came within metres of spotting the midget submarines. The Takao was camouflaged and took some time to locate. Unknown to the XE-3, the commander of the XE-1, Lieutenant John Smart, decided that it was too risky to travel the further two miles into the harbour to reach the Miyoko, and so he decided to target the Takao as well, dropping his Amatol charges beneath her hull. On the XE-3, the diver was acting leading seaman James Joseph McGuinness. McGuinness, the surname can also be found spelt McGuinness, and he was called both Jim and Mick in the Navy, was born in the poor neighbourhood of West Belfast in 1919. In 1934, McGuinness's older brother Bill joined the Royal Navy, and in 1935... 
James followed him, enlisting as a 15-year-old boy recruit. He had attempted to enlist in the army, but was told he was too poorly educated. McGuinness trained at the HMS Ganges at Shotley, overlooking Harwich, for nine months before joining the fleet. As a first-class boy, he served on the battleship Royal Sovereign, the cruisers Dauntless and Enterprise, and then aircraft carrier Hermes. When war broke out, McGuinness was assigned to the destroyer HMS Kandahar, serving in the North Sea and Mediterranean before she struck a mine in December 1941. In 1942, McGuinness was drafted to HMS Defiance Torpedo School in Devonport, intended to serve on the new cruiser HMS Belfast. Before that, however, he was drafted into the submarine service training at HMS Dolphin at Gosport. He then joined H-50 in February 1943. In March, McGuinness volunteered to join the Special Service in the new X-Craft. He trained in Scotland at the shore base HMS Varble, learning to dive there. He then took part in Operation Source, the attack on the Tirpitz by X-Craft, serving on X-7 and was mentioned in dispatches. In 1944, McGuinness was chosen for service on the new XE series of midget submarines, which would be going into operation against Japan. Unusually, McGuinness was chosen as diver, a job usually reserved for officers. Training for the new craft took place in summer of 1944, at the same time as the D-Day landings, and lasted six months. Divers were trained in wire cutting to make a hole for the X-craft to pass through, as well as the placement of limpet mines. When training was complete, the new craft and crews sailed for the Pacific via the Azores, Trinidad, the Panama Canal, Hawaii and Brisbane before reaching Sydney. There they prepared for action, hoping that the war was not already considered won. The cruiser Takao was reached by XE-3 at about 0700 hours on the 1st of August. The crew had travelled all night without sleep and through 80 miles of mined enemy waters. C.O. Fraser dived his midget submarine to the bottom of the harbour and then McGuinness took the opportunity for a short sleep. The crew also took benzodrine tablets so that they would feel refreshed when the boat returned to periscope depth. They passed Changai Prison and hoped the boom across the strait would be up, otherwise McGuinness would need to cut a hole through it. They were in luck and the boom was raised. They continued to move forward and narrowly avoided being spotted by a troop ship. McGuinness began the arduous process of suiting up in the cramped conditions of the submarine. XE-3 had been submerged for seven hours C.O. Fraser put the XE-3 on the bottom amidships of the Takao, with only a foot of clearance above her to the keel of the heavy cruiser. McGuinness entered the wet and dry compartment of the submarine and flooded it, ready for his dive. He discovered, however, that the hatch would not open all the way, as it struck the keel of the Takao before it was fully open. McGuinness, showing remarkable bravery and ingenuity, removed his breathing apparatus and squeezed through the gap and then replaced the apparatus. The water was very murky and visibility was poor. The hull of the Takao was covered in barnacles and seaweed. McGuinness would have to clear six spaces for the midget submarine's limpet mines. He soon learnt that their magnets would not hold to the hull without a clean surface and they kept sliding off. He returned to the submarine, removed his breathing apparatus again, and squeezed back in. Finding some rope aboard the midget submarine, he repeated his arduous procedure back out of the hull of the Takao. The squeeze was even tighter this time, owing to the falling tide. Once back under the Takao, McGuinness used the rope to clear a space for each mine. In doing so, he cut both his hands and his suit on the razor-sharp barnacles, causing his suit to leak. 
telltale oxygen bubbles began rising from his suit to the surface. McGuinness later estimated that he spent at least 45 minutes placing the mines. He placed them in pairs, one on each side of the keel. His return to the XE3 was even more difficult than his second exit, but he managed to squeeze in a final time. C.O. Fraser later marvelled at the number of firsts McGuinness had achieved. He was the first diver to remove and reattach his breathing apparatus underwater, the first Royal Navy diver to place mines on an enemy ship, the first to leave and return and leave again. Fraser now found he had difficulties of his own. The falling tide meant that the XE3 was all but wedged against the sea bottom, and the Takao's keel. Fraser was only able to free the submarine by blowing his ballast tanks and therefore surfacing momentarily. He recalled that the Takao looked as big as a bloody battleship. He then released both of the submarine's Atomol explosive charges. One of the Atomol carriers did not detach, however, and had become flooded with water, making it impossible for the submarine to move. Fraser intended to dive to release the carrier manually, but McGuinness was still in his diving gear and asked that he be allowed, as the diver, to go. He just needed five minutes to get his breath back. Fraser later recalled that his chest fairly heaved as he panted for breath in the oxygen-scarce atmosphere of the boat, and the muscles of his arms gleaming and rippled as he pulled the tight rubber neck piece up under his arms, and that, despite his exhaustion, his oxygen leak, and the fact that there was every probability of his being sighted, McGuinness at once volunteered to leave the craft and free the carrier, rather than allow a less experienced diver to undertake the job. The crew waited the painstaking five minutes and then McGuinness went out again and released the flooded carrier with a spanner. This took seven minutes and McGuinness risked being spotted at any moment. Eventually the carrier fell away, allowing the submarine to escape. She was still not safe, however, and had to race the tide to reach the open sea again through the same 80 miles of mined enemy seaway. The XE3 reached open sea at 2100 hours that night when they reached the HMSM Stygian. Again at 2350 hours they had been operating for 52 hours without a break. The crew of the Stygian reported a huge explosion at 2130 and the XE3 crew later learned that the XE1 had dropped its atomol charges under the Takao 2, although they had not placed any mines. The explosives tore a 60-foot hole in the hull and put the Takao's guns out of action. Plans for the XE3 to return and sink the Miyoko were made, but Japan's surrender on August 15th made that mission unnecessary. Not only was James McGuinness the first Northern Ireland native to be awarded the Victoria Cross, he was also the first junior rating from the submarine service to be so honoured. Only two other junior ratings were honoured during World War II. Both of those awards were posthumous. In addition to McGuinness's Victoria Cross, his CO Lieutenant Ian Fraser was also awarded the Victoria Cross and later wrote an account of his exploits in Frogman VC in 1957. The XE3 deputy, Sub-Lieutenant William Kiwi Smith, received the DSO, and the ERA, Alfred Reed, received the Conspicuous Gallantry Medal. The crew of the XE1 received DSOs and DSMs. The limelight into which McGuinness was thrust was completely unexpected, he was feted in Sydney and flown home, especially on a Sunderland flying boat. The flight took them to Singapore, where the hulk of the Takao and the Miyoko were being used to hold Japanese prisoners. It did not take long for the political and religious divisions in Northern Ireland to make mileage out of McGuinness's award, turning him into both a political and religious pariah. This began even before McGuinness had received his award, which he did at Buckingham Palace on December 15, 1945. 
He was welcomed in Belfast in late 1945, but the welcome was short-lived. As a boy recruit who enlisted in 1935, McGuinness still had four years of service left. He would need to enlist for a further ten if he wanted a pension. He would demobilise in 1949, but by then he had been demoted due to drunkenness and a period in detention. He returned to Belfast but suffered ill health and was broke by 1952 when he sold his medal for £75. Marmaduke Furness, Viscount Furness, discovered the circumstances of the sale and bought it back for him. Although McGuinness being returned his Victoria Cross was turned into a humiliating news story. This event seems to have cemented the idea for McGuinness to leave Belfast and Ireland permanently. The Roman Catholic McGuinness was shunned in Belfast after World War II. The city did not appreciate a British war hero and McGuinness moved to Doncaster and then Bradford. His status as the first Northern Irish Victoria Cross recipient was ignored for many years, although he was honoured in Bradford. His actual diving suit is on display at the Imperial War Museum. The McGuinness Victoria Cross was also the first purchased by Lord Ashcroft in 1986, soon after McGuinness's death from bronchitis at the age of 65. A plaque commemorating his home was finally erected in Belfast in 1998 and a memorial statue erected in Belfast in 1999. On that occasion, his former commanding officer, Ian Fraser, remarked that, I have never met a braver man. Thank you for that once again, Murray. And if you have an idea for a subject you'd like us to cover, which you think we might not have covered yet, then drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org. And once again, if you would care to become a patron of the podcast, we would very much appreciate that. You can do so by going to patreon.com forward slash thehistorynetwork. Thank you once again to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast, written by Murray Darm, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>